The human body is a marvel of intricate systems working together to sustain life. One such system, often overlooked yet profoundly important, is the urinary system. Tasked with filtering waste products from the blood and expelling them as urine, the urinary system plays a critical role in maintaining the body's delicate internal balance. Without it, toxins would quickly build up, leading to illness and eventually death. The urinary system is composed of four main components. The kidneys, ureters, bladder and urethra. The kidneys, two bean-shaped organs located in the upper abdominal cavity, are the workhorses of the system. They filter blood, removing waste products and excess fluids while retaining essential substances. The waste-laden fluid, now called urine, travels down two narrow tubes called ureters to the bladder, a muscular sac that stores urine until it can be expelled. Finally, urine exits the body through the urethra, a single tube controlled by a sphincter muscle. The urinary system's importance extends beyond waste removal. It also plays a vital role in regulating blood pressure, maintaining electrolyte balance and producing hormones that contribute to red blood cell production and bone health. In essence, the urinary system is a complex and elegant system that ensures the body's internal environment remains stable and conducive to life. The intricate interplay between the kidneys, ureters, bladder and urethra highlights the interconnectedness of the human body. Each component plays a specific role, working in harmony to maintain the body's internal equilibrium. The kidneys, those unassuming bean-shaped organs, are the powerhouses of the urinary system. Positioned on either side of the spine, just below the ribcage, they tirelessly filter blood, removing waste products and excess fluids. Their vital function is protected by their location, nestled behind the peritoneum, a membrane that lines the abdominal cavity and cushioned by layers of fat. Externally, the kidneys exhibit a smooth, convex outer border and a concave inner border where the renal hilum resides. This indented region serves as the entry and exit point for blood vessels, nerves and the ureter. A tough, fibrous capsule encases each kidney, providing an additional layer of protection. Internally, the kidneys are divided into two distinct regions, the outer cortex and the inner medulla. The cortex, granular in appearance, houses the nephrons, the functional units of the kidneys responsible for filtration. The medulla, composed of cone-shaped structures called renal pyramids, plays a crucial role in concentrating urine. Blood, laden with waste products and essential nutrients alike, enters the kidneys through the renal artery, a major branch of the aorta. This vital fluid is distributed to millions of microscopic filtering units called nephrons where the intricate process of blood filtration and urine formation takes place. Once filtered, the cleansed blood exits the kidneys through the renal vein, returning to the heart to be recirculated throughout the body. The kidneys' remarkable efficiency in filtering blood and maintaining the body's internal balance is a testament to their complex structure and the intricate interplay between their internal components. Within the kidney's intricate architecture lie millions of microscopic filtering units called nephrons, the true workhorses of the urinary system. Each nephron acts as a mini filtration plant, meticulously processing blood to remove waste products while retaining essential substances. The nephron's structure, a marvel of biological engineering, reflects its complex function. Each nephron comprises two main parts, the renal corpuscle and the renal tubule. The renal corpuscle, the filtration unit, consists of a tangled network of capillaries called the glomerulus and a cup-shaped structure called Bowman's capsule. Blood enters the glomerulus under high pressure, forcing fluids and small solutes through the capillary walls and into Bowman's capsule, forming filtrate. This filtrate, now free of blood cells and large proteins, enters the renal tubule for further processing. The renal tubule, a long winding tube, extends from Bowman's capsule and is divided into four main segments, the proximal convoluted tubule, the loop of Henle, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct. As filtrate flows through these segments, essential substances like water, glucose, amino acids, and electrolytes are reabsorbed into the bloodstream while waste products and excess ions are secreted from the blood into the tubule. The final product, urine, exits the collecting duct and flows into the renal pelvis, the funnel-shaped structure that collects urine from all the nephrons in a kidney. Two main types of nephrons exist within the kidneys, 
cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. Cortical nephrons, located primarily in the cortex, have short loops of Henle, while juxtamedullary nephrons, situated near the medulla, possess long loops of Henle that extend deep into the medulla's salty environment. This difference in structure allows juxtamedullary nephrons to concentrate urine, a crucial function in maintaining the body's fluid balance. The journey of waste removal begins with an intricate dance of pressure and permeability within the nephron's renal corpuscle. This process, known as glomerular filtration, represents the first crucial step in urine formation. Driven by the force of blood pressure, water and small solutes are pushed through the glomerulus's capillary walls, leaving behind blood cells and large proteins. The glomerulus, a tight knot of capillaries, acts as a sieve, allowing only certain substances to pass through its walls. The pressure gradient between the blood flowing through the glomerulus and the fluid-filled Bowman's capsule provides the driving force for filtration. This pressure differential, governed by Starling's law of pressures, ensures a continuous flow of filtrate from the bloodstream into Bowman's capsule. Starling's law describes the balance between hydrostatic pressure the outward force exerted by a fluid and oncotic pressure, the inward force exerted by proteins. In the glomerulus, the hydrostatic pressure within the capillaries exceeds the oncotic pressure, pushing fluids and small solutes across the capillary walls and into Bowman's capsule. The filtrate, a watery solution resembling plasma but lacking large proteins, then embarks on its journey through the renal tubule, where it undergoes further processing. Glomerular filtration, the initial step in urine formation, highlights the kidney's remarkable ability to separate waste products from essential blood components. This intricate process, governed by the principles of pressure and permeability, ensures that only substances small enough to pass through the glomerular filter enter the renal tubule for further processing. Section 5. The Glomerular Filtration Rate, a measure of kidney function. The efficiency of the kidneys in filtering blood is reflected in a crucial metric known as the glomerular filtration rate, or GFR. This measure, expressed as the volume of filtrate formed by all nephrons in both kidneys per minute, provides valuable insights into kidney function. A healthy GFR typically ranges from 90 to 120 milliliters per minute per 1.73 square meters of body surface area, indicating that the kidneys are effectively removing waste products from the bloodstream. However, several factors can influence GFR, including age, blood pressure, and the intricate interplay of blood vessels supplying the kidneys. As we age, our kidneys naturally experience a gradual decline in function, resulting in a lower GFR. This age-related decline is a normal physiological process, but significant deviations from the expected range may warrant further investigation. Blood pressure plays a crucial role in maintaining GFR. The pressure gradient between the blood flowing through the glomerular capillaries and the fluid-filled Bowman's capsule drives filtration. Consequently, fluctuations in blood pressure can directly impact GFR. High blood pressure can increase GFR, potentially damaging the kidneys over time, while low blood pressure can reduce GFR, hindering waste removal. Furthermore, the constriction or dilation of the afferent arterioles, the blood vessels supplying the glomerulus, can fine-tune GFR. Constriction of these vessels reduces blood flow to the glomerulus, lowering GFR, while dilation increases blood flow and raises GFR. This intricate control mechanism allows the kidneys to maintain a relatively stable GFR, even when systemic blood pressure fluctuates. Section 6, Reabsorption and Secretion, Refining the Filtrate. As the filtrate, that watery solution resembling plasma, embarks on its journey through the renal tubule, it undergoes a meticulous refinement process involving two key mechanisms, reabsorption and secretion. These processes ensure that essential substances are returned to the bloodstream, while waste products and excess ions are targeted for excretion. Reabsorption, as its name suggests, involves the movement of substances from the renal tubule back into the bloodstream. This selective retrieval process primarily occurs in the proximal convoluted tubule, the segment of the renal tubule immediately following Bowman's capsule. Here, approximately 65% of the filtered water, sodium and chloride are reabsorbed, along with nearly all of the filtered glucose, amino acids and bicarbonate. 
This reabsorption process is driven by a combination of active transport, passive diffusion and osmosis, ensuring that the body retains vital nutrients and electrolytes. Secretion, the counterpart to reabsorption, involves the transfer of substances from the bloodstream into the renal tubule. This process, occurring throughout the renal tubule, serves two primary functions, eliminating waste products that were not filtered in the glomerulus and regulating the body's acid-base balance. Waste products like creatinine drugs and drug metabolites are actively secreted into the tubule, destined for excretion in urine. Glucose reabsorption, a critical process occurring in the proximal convoluted tubule, exemplifies the selectivity of the reabsorption mechanism. Glucose, an essential energy source for the body, is entirely reabsorbed from the filtrate under normal circumstances. This reabsorption process relies on specialized transporter proteins that bind to glucose molecules and ferry them across the tubular cells back into the bloodstream. However, these transporter proteins have a limited capacity known as the transport maximum. If the glucose concentration in the filtrate exceeds this threshold, as may occur in individuals with diabetes, glucose spills over into the urine, a telltale sign of uncontrolled blood sugar levels. Section 7, Maintaining Balance, How Kidneys Regulate pH, Potassium and Calcium. Beyond their role in filtering waste products, the kidneys play a critical role in maintaining the body's delicate internal balance. Acting as master regulators, they fine-tune the blood's pH, potassium levels and calcium levels, ensuring that these crucial parameters remain within a narrow range compatible with life. The blood's pH, a measure of its acidity or alkalinity, is tightly regulated within a narrow range of 7.35 to 7.45. Even slight deviations from this range can disrupt cellular function and prove fatal. The kidneys contribute to pH balance by controlling the excretion of hydrogen ions, the determinants of acidity. When blood pH drops, becoming more acidic, the kidneys excrete more hydrogen ions while reabsorbing bicarbonate ions, which act as buffers to neutralize acids. Conversely, when blood pH rises, becoming more alkaline, the kidneys conserve hydrogen ions and excrete bicarbonate ions. Potassium, an essential mineral involved in nerve impulse transmission, muscle contraction and heart function, is tightly regulated by the kidneys. Fluctuations in potassium levels can have serious consequences affecting heart rhythm and nerve function. The kidneys maintain potassium balance through a combination of reabsorption and secretion. Under normal circumstances, most of the filtered potassium is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule and loop of Henle. However, the distal tubule and collecting duct can secrete potassium into the urine, fine-tuning potassium excretion based on the body's needs. Calcium crucial for bone health, muscle contraction and nerve function, is also under the kidney's regulatory purview. The kidneys influence calcium levels by controlling its reabsorption and by activating vitamin D, a hormone that promotes calcium absorption in the intestines. When blood calcium levels drop, the parathyroid glands release parathyroid hormone, which stimulates the kidneys to reabsorb more calcium and activate vitamin D, ultimately increasing calcium levels in the blood. Conversely, when blood calcium levels rise, the kidneys reduce calcium reabsorption and vitamin D activation, restoring balance. Section 8. From filtrate to urine, the concentration process. As the filtrate, now refined through the processes of reabsorption and secretion, reaches the renal medulla, it undergoes a remarkable transformation, transitioning from a dilute solution to a concentrated waste product known as urine. This concentration process, crucial for conserving water and maintaining the body's fluid balance, relies on the intricate interplay between the loop of Henle, the collecting ducts, and a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. The loop of Henle, with its descending and ascending limbs, creates a concentration gradient within the renal medulla, a key factor in urine concentration. The descending limb, permeable to water but impermeable to solutes, allows water to move out of the filtrate and into the surrounding salty medulla, concentrating the filtrate. The ascending limb, impermeable to water but permeable to solutes, actively pumps sodium and chloride ions out of the filtrate and into the medulla, further enhancing the concentration gradient. The collecting ducts, the final conduits for urine before it reaches the renal pelvis, play a crucial role in fine-tuning urine concentration. 
These ducts, responsive to antidiuretic hormone, can become more or less permeable to water, influencing the amount of water reabsorbed from the filtrate. When the body needs to conserve water, the pituitary gland releases antidiuretic hormone, increasing the collecting duct's permeability to water. Water then flows out of the filtrate and into the surrounding medulla, producing concentrated urine. Conversely, when the body has excess water, antidiuretic hormone release is suppressed, reducing the collecting duct's permeability to water. Consequently, more water remains in the filtrate, producing dilute urine. This intricate feedback mechanism, orchestrated by antidiuretic hormone, ensures that the body maintains an appropriate balance of fluids. Section 9. Urine Expulsion – A Coordinated Effort once the filtrate has undergone its transformation into urine, a concentrated solution laden with waste products, it embarks on its final journey out of the body, a process known as micturition or urination. This seemingly simple act, often taken for granted, involves a complex interplay between the bladder, the urethra and the nervous system, requiring both voluntary and involuntary control. Urine, continuously produced by the kidneys, flows through the ureters, two slender tubes connecting the kidneys to the bladder. The bladder, a hollow muscular organ located in the pelvis, acts as a reservoir, storing urine until it can be expelled. As urine accumulates in the bladder, stretch receptors within its walls send signals to the brain, alerting us to the need to urinate. The urge to urinate, initially subtle, intensifies as the bladder fills, triggering a conscious decision to seek relief. Urination, however, involves more than simply willing oneself to go. It requires the coordinated relaxation of two sphincter muscles, the internal urethral sphincter under involuntary control and the external urethral sphincter under voluntary control. When we decide to urinate, the brain sends signals to relax the internal urethral sphincter and contract the detrusor muscle, the smooth muscle lining the bladder wall. This coordinated action increases pressure within the bladder, forcing urine into the urethra. Simultaneously, we consciously relax the external urethral sphincter, allowing urine to flow out of the body. Once urination is complete, the sphincter muscles contract, the bladder relaxes, and the cycle begins anew.